So I think what we want to do, if uh, we follow our previous procedures, we'll do introductions and we'll have people uh, tell tell us how they came to systems thinking and uh, where they're located. Is there anything else I should be having them say, Mr. David? No, that'd okay. be fine. And I think since Zad's going to jump off, we're going to have him do his first. <laughs> sure, thank you. Uh, nice to be here. Hello, everyone. I'm uh, online and coming from Toronto, uh, Ontario, here in Canada. And I came to Systems Thinking by way of OCAD U University, um, the Strate Strategic Foresight and Innovation Program. Um, I was a student in that program, um, and I had a systems course with Professor Peter Jones. Um, and David Ng was a guest lecturer, and so that's how I've connected to the community. Nice to see you all uh, after the while, and I'll be hanging around, kind of jumping on and off uh, here and there. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Zed. So in the order that I have it on my screen, I'm not sure what order you folks have it, we're going to do Elena next. Uh, okay, well, uh, Elena Leonard in Toronto. Uh, I came into systems because I was... Um, taking a course with Barry Clemson at the University of Maryland, who was at that point president of the American Society for Cybernetics. And so <clears throat> I was impressed with his course, took the next one, which was on cybernetics, and have been there ever since in cybernetics or systems. But there's a lot of overlap. Thank you. Mr. Hawk. <gasps> <laughs> That's Hawk, not... Uh. <laughs> Oh my God! Oh, <clears throat> uh, I'm lost in Iowa, so I was looking for Toronto, but I can't find it. So I'm just here in Iowa, waiting, waiting for the next election to be done. Mm. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Very good, Helen. Hi, I'm in Pueblo, Colorado. I'm a retired attorney and professor. And I became interested, especially in systems analogy, um, through talking with a professor, a colleague at the university. And I found this and decided to join. Thank you, Helen. I think the next person is Aisha. Did I say that right, Aisha? Yes, hello, hello. It is Aisha. Did I get that, get that right? Yes, yes, yes. All right. Thank you. Go ahead. I am a student in the MDES program in Strategic Foresight and Innovation at OCAT in my final year. And I've been introduced to systems thinking through Peter Jones and to this uh, community of practice as well through him. Nice meeting, everyone. Thank you. Okay, Joshua. I, I um, am in Toronto, and I um, came to this um, group through uh, the uh, sustainable uh, business model group. Yeah, and I've been coming to these meetings for a few years off and on. Hey, okay, thank you, Joshua. Okay, Kelly. Maybe she's not there. Hey. Oh, there she is. Okay. Got that one done. Okay. I'm Kelly Okamira. I'm part of the System Changes Learning Group, and my background is in change. Uh, so that, that's what I bring to the table, and I'm still trying to figure out systems as quickly as I can. But hey, <laughs> I'm here, and I'm cooking nice. dinner. So that's why I'm on, uh, what do you call it? Mute. Stop, uh, stop video. Stop video mute. Okay. I'm here. All right. Thank you. Uh, Louis? Um, yeah. hi, hi, everyone. Um, Luis, I'm in Pittsburgh. Um, I'm doing a PhD in transition design. That's uh, at uh, Carnegie Mellon. And that's how I kind of got introduced to systems before and now during the program. Um, so yeah, happy to be here. Thank you. Uh, Nelia? 
Uh, hello, I'm in Toronto. Um, I'm a, a former student of David Ng. I did the uh, Strategic Foresight Program at OCAD. I never finished. I didn't finish my MRP, but uh, that's okay. <laughs> Maybe one day soon. Um, uh, before that, I, I was a, a lawyer and uh, I worked in the technology space, and now I'm working um, doing strategic foresight with the Canadian Revenue Agency. So, yeah, lots of systems. Thanks. Thank you. The NAD. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Nenad or Ned, if it's easier. Um, I, I think I joined the, uh, the Systems of Ontario um, 2016 or something like that, but then I was missing for a while. I, uh, I spent some time in New York as a worked for the United Nations. Uh, so I came back to Toronto and actually I moved to Picton, to Ontario, which is just on the lake, um, a month ago or so. So I'm now in between New York and Picton and Toronto is a bit on, on the side, sidelines. But in terms of systems, I, I think I, I came into systems space uh, mainly through political science and learning organization and that kind of stuff. Um, but then more directly, um, systemic design, and I'm, I'm also a SFI graduate. This is how I learned about this particular uh, COP. Thanks. Thanks, Nan. Eva? Hi, I'm Eva. I come from Toronto, Ontario. Um, I was also um, from OCAT doing the Strategic Foresight Innovation Program. And I think I saw this event through the SFI group, so I decided to join. Glad to have you. Thank you. Ian. Hi, everyone. Um, this, this is my first um, meeting with this group. So nice to see you all. Um, I'm assuming the check-in question is around sort of your background and your connection to systems change, systems innovation work. Yeah, and also where, you, where you're located is the other thing people are adding to that. Thank you. So yeah, I'm located in Toronto. Um, uh, I come to systems change or innovation work. And I uh, worked for seven years with Rio's partners and we have now, uh, and, and I'm working on my own now, but have been sort of doing a lot of work around multi-stakeholder systems change initiatives and facilitating and designing those. Um, and as well, I come to this work through my first career in theater, so bringing creative process into that um, mix. Uh, discovered this group through um, Joanna Dong with the Systems, Systems Innovation Hub here in Toronto. So she let me know this. Elsa and I said, who's here, and had heard, heard, from, uh, heard about the group from him as well. So happy to be here tonight. Welcome, Ian. We're really glad to have you. Uh, my name is Dan Ng, also from Toronto, and I came from systems from David Ng System Changes Learning Circle. Are you going to do an intro, David, or are you kind of don't uh, need to? I, I will, actually, in the presentation. Oh. Oh, okay. All right, then. Welcome, everyone. Really uh, great to see you all. It's gonna. Be, I have a feeling this is going to be a lot of fun. And if not, you don't get your money back. <laughs> yes. Mm hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Dan, Dan, can I make a quick comment? Since we have two lawyers present. <laughs> uh, on Friday, I got to experience an integration of cybernetics and law. And I still haven't recovered from it. <laughs> it had to do with selling a property in New Jersey. And in order to finalize the contract, they said I had to have a lawyer. So I hired one over the phone. We agreed but I had to send the contract and particulars to the lawyer. So I sent them. Then I got back a message saying that in order to send to this address, I must take a test because we've had so much spam and we don't want spam. So you must take a test. So I took a cybernetics test they sent to me and I got uh, 0.6 and it came back and said, I'm required to have 5.0. Otherwise I am not qualified to speak to this lawyer. And so I began to send messages to the lawyer and they kept being rejected. And it kept reminding me I had a 0.6 as my score and there was nothing they could do about me. They were very sorry, but she would not be able to help you in the future. 
So I gave up and hired another lawyer that didn't understand cybernetics. And we were fine over the weekend. <laughs> this morning, the lawyer contacted me back again and wanted to know what the hell is going on. <laughs> and I said, I don't know. Talk to your cybernetics people. You're the one that set up the system. Anyway, it's a, it's a sign of hope, right? Thank you, David. That was very refreshing, as always. <laughs> Okay, so let me start. Um, so this talk was actually prepared for a, a presentation at University of Barcelona, uh, where um, it was actually a very uh, short preparation because uh, we were leaving, um, like within one or two days of leaving for uh, for Spain uh, to go to the uh, Creative Systemic Research Platform Institute um, meeting. And uh, so I sent a note to a professor there and. Uh, and said, uh, I'd like to meet. And I said, oh, I usually give lectures, but I'm not sure how you feel, how they feel about English speakers. He came back and said, okay, you can do a lecture at 10 o'clock and one to two o'clock. And I was like, oh, okay. So this is the two o'clock lecture. Um, the name of this lecture is Reifying Systems Thinking Towards Changes. Uh, the focus um, of System Thinking Ontario is obviously system thinking, um, but uh, reifying is a term that's actually used in computer science when you actually try to remake, in effect, a program. Um, and so you reorganize things and remake, because uh, the uh, AFI is making. So you're remaking systems thinking. And so we're not trying to, um, to uh, displace system thinking, but we're trying to get people oriented and thinking more about change because it's a lot oriented, a lot of um, interest in that recently. And uh, after um, we're, so we have members of the System Changes Learning Circle here. Uh, we had committed to meet uh, at least tri weekly for four, for 10 years, and we're in year four. Uh, and we've come up with the ideas of rhythmic shifts. Um, texture, which actually becomes contexture, and propensity uh, amongst living systems. And so uh, we're not so interested in uh, mechanical systems, we're interested in living systems. Um, and so this presentation um, will go through, and I got to take a break somewhere in the middle. Um, so this is the uh, introduction for people who, who haven't seen me or don't know me. Um, the uh, 37 is actually from August. Um, uh, this, uh, the story I give is that this is what happens when you've been in graduate school too long. Uh, so my wife and I got married seven, 37 years ago. And uh, having been in grad school and learned about rationality, uh, getting married for an indefinite period of time is actually an irrational act. And so we should actually do something about that. So uh, when we got married, uh, the uh, declaration was that um, on paper, it said we'd be married forever, but we had the side agreement, which is every year we would come back and decide whether we want to be married for one more year. And so for 37 years, we've come back and we want to be married. We'll see if we make it through another year. Um, but this is the family and uh, the people that uh, are around um, that observe every year. Uh, right now, I am a research fellow with the Creative, Sy Creative Systemic Research Platform. Um, I was president of the International Society for System Sciences. Uh, it shows up sometimes that I was 28 years with IBM uh, doing management consulting work, uh, market development work, and headquarters planning. And I've been teaching in various places in Finland, Canada, China, and uh, around the world. Um, so I'm going to talk firstly about the motivation for uh, actually the whole system changes learning circle work. And I'm going to talk about the doing part, which will cover some of the work that we did with uh, Code for Canada with the Canadian Digital Service. Um, I'm going to take a break after that and see if people have caught up to that, because as we go into section C about thinking and D and making, we get deeper and deeper. And so um, we'll see if we can actually make it simple enough. Um, if we aren't making it simple enough, then we actually have a lot more work to do. Um, we're actually interested in uh, canvassing the SFI community to look for people that might help us with explaining, uh, because uh, a lot of the challenge we have with the Rethinking System Thinking project is not so much the theory, it's actually making uh, or, or preparing things that people can understand and actually be able to facilitate. So the genesis of this um, work is actually at the ISSS San Jose 2012 meeting uh, when I was president of the ISSS. And uh, the theme then was service systems, natural systems. 
Um, then we were talking about service system science as something that had shifted um, significantly. And natural systems, we are, at that point, we're talking about the Anthropocene. Um, so in 2012, um, it's now been 10 years, and I think, I hope everyone's heard about the word anthrop Anthropocene, but in I'd say that Anthropocene word actually got coined probably around 2010, 2011. And so uh, with that became this research paper, Rethinking Systems Thinking. And it was actually a plea to uh, to look at system thinking because a lot of the system thinking that we have, I think, is caught in the 1980s, uh, and it hasn't been updated. So um, the question was, how far would we go with that? Uh, in the paper itself, it's quite long. It actually reviews a lot of the uh, of the history um, from the general systems theory and from the system sciences community. Um, and then uh, the question was, well, where do we go from here? So what we noticed, and this started in 2019 when we formed, uh, 2018, before we formed the System Changes Learning Circle, was there's a lot of interest in system change. Uh, and that raised the question of, well, what do they really mean by systems change and what's not a systems change? Uh, so here are various uh, sources uh, that have done work on it. The OECD has done work. And for them, systems change is very much a focus on government. Uh, in the Stanford so uh, Social Innovation Review, policymakers, foundations, and NGOs solving the root problems, intractable problems, what they wanted. Uh, the UNDP has this three three phase methodology: uh, sense and frame, engage, position, and transform. So they're method oriented. And then the one that sparked us was actually the meeting that the Forum for the Future had with the McConnell Foundation, where they had uh, they convened a meeting at Waston Island in summer of 2018. Uh, Peter Jones is one of the people that went to that meeting, and uh, and Benjamin Taylor went to that meeting. And I asked them um, when they came back. We we all had dinner together, and I had said I had one question. If you're talking about systems change, do people know what a system is? And if you actually look at the report. Uh, what they did is they ducked the question. They said, we're not actually going to define systems change. We're interested in building a field around it. Um, so systems change is pretty well whatever you want it to be. And that's actually problematic. Uh, if you actually can't decide what's a system change and what's not a systems change, then um, I'm not sure what you're working on. The common idea of change uh, that that uh, that uh, has been published is change as three steps, and it's attributed to Kurt Levine. Uh, most people know it's Kurt Lewin, um, but uh, and, and Kurt Lewin was actually at the foundation of a lot of the work that we get in socio-technical systems theory and socio-ecological systems theory. Uh, but he actually never said refreeze. Um, so if you go to uh, take uh, an organizational change program and they they have the idea of, well, the way to change the system is that you unfreeze the system and then you change it and you refreeze the system. Well, it actually doesn't really work that way. And if you start reading um, Lewin a lot closer, you start thinking about the issues you get into about fields and you have kind of strong understanding about systems. So if this is not the way we're going to do systems thinking, then how should we think about it? Henry Mintzberg had this idea, if you want to come from the strategy uh, perspective, that we have intended strategies, uh, of which some strategies are unrealized and they never really happen. Uh, from the intended strategies, we have a deliberate strategy, which becomes realized, but then as you're doing that realized strategy, you have all these emergent strategies that come or things that you didn't think about. So there's a lot going on when you talk about strategy as plan or change or these sorts of things. So 2022 has actually been a big year for the System Changes Learning Circle. Um, we uh, we did uh, the first thing, the major thing we did in, in April, in May, in March and April was uh, the uh, the engagement with the Canadian Digital Service. Um, that's actually available online and it is uh, a pilot for trying out the framework that I'll tell you in the second part. Um, there's a, uh, a preprint out for, for um, system changes in the Journal of Sustainable, Smart Sustainable uh, Business, um, and uh, it's actually been accepted. It's all ready to go. It's just a mechanical thing. They're waiting for the uh, DOI to get assigned for that, and then we'll release that officially. 
Um, the third thing that came up was that in July, um, I was uh, one of the speakers, I was a plenary speaker for the International Society for the System Sciences. And that's actually a different talk. Um, and that's a paper that's going to be published next year. It's been submitted and hopefully it will make it into systems research and behavioral science. So what is system changes learning? Um, and how are we approaching systems changes learning? Uh, the idea of systems change, how do you change a system, uh, is focused on learning. Um, a, a system has to learn about the change. The way we start is up in the uh, upper left with triggering conversations. And so uh, people tend to have to work out what they mean by systems changes, what they need to learn, those sorts of things. And then we have three three um, practices that come along with that, uh, three activities that come along with that, uh, the doing, which is progressing the practices, and that's trying to uh, create a um, guidelines or understanding for practitioners that would actually be working at a practice level. Separate from that, we have progressing theories, which is thinking about it differently. Uh, it's actually possible to have practice without theory. Uh, one of the things I learned from the systems engineering community was that they're saying engineering actually precedes science. They can make things work, but they don't know why it works. Um, and this is the case where you could actually have uh, an applied science without having the science behind it. Uh, we'd like to develop them together at the same time and make sure that's well grounded. Uh, and then the other thing, other activity we're working on, which is um, we'll probably be starting on in a couple of years, is progressing the methods. And that is actually being um, systematic about how we would do system changes learning. Um, it, systematic does not necessarily mean systemic, but if when you're trying to explain to someone methods, they have to be systematic. So all of this is wrapped up and uh, it's modeled actually in object process language uh, that describes, um, so it, it describes how all these things fit together. So I'm gonna talk about doing, uh, and the, the central idea we have there is a hub and four spokes. This is actually the session agenda for the Canadian Digital Service. It was a workshop that was done um, breaking over lunch. Uh, we had a presentation for 60 minutes. I'm gonna give you a, a hint as some of that stuff. We introduced the ideas about action learning practices as a hub and four spokes. Uh, we had lunch break. We came back in a workshop forming as groups. Uh, we, we worked our way around the hub, uh, the, the hub and the four spokes and the knowing from within, um, we'll, we'll see contextual influences and uh, diagnosing rhythmic disorders kind of took us halfway around. The prognosing likelihood, we took coffee break, we had came back and prognosing likelihoods and then reordering pacing. And then we had a reflection on that and we had the show and tell. Um, so that was the workshop and uh, they managed to make it all the way through and understand pretty well where we were going. So we're talking about systems thinking. Um, there's a, a wide range on systems thinking and what you mean by systems thinking. This is from uh, the uh, Ramage and Ship article on systems thinkers, the book on systems thinkers, which is good as a history of science. And what we see in the uh, circles is all the different varieties of, of, uh, of, of systems and the heritage it comes from. So you have the early cybernetics people, um, the science of communication and how they work with that and information. Uh, general systems theory tends to be more oriented toward biology and how you bring those ideas over. Systems dynamics is more mathematical, comes out of the MIT, um, uh, systems dynamic uh, and the Club of Rome work. Soft and critical systems focuses on human systems. Uh, labor cybernetics uh, has a second order cybernetics where the early cybernetics um, originally was first order. Uh, and the learning systems um, is a, uh, a derivation from the soft and critical systems community. Um, there's also uh, the complexity theory that's emerged um, and that's that's kind of the newest field. And uh, actually, at the ISSS 2006 meeting, uh, there's interesting discussion that it used to be that chaos was not something discussed in systems, but uh, complexity theory brought the idea that chaos is okay to discuss. Um, and so that's relatively new. The preferences that I have, and this may not be true from everyone in the system changes learning circle, is that I tend to lean on general systems theory, on soft and critical systems, and on learning systems. Um, and so that other people do it different ways and that's fine. Uh, it's good to know where you're coming from. Um, on top of those um, three preferences, we've added on some new fields that are, uh, this is part of the rethinking systems thinking. 
is the, the idea behind the system scientist community wasn't that system sciences is supposed to become a field or discipline on itself, but it should be drawing on other fields and disciplines that are in development. So the, the first one that we've done a lot of drawing on is ecological anthropology with, through J.J. Gibson and Tim Ingold. Um, and the idea um, that is, uh, it's related to the socio-ecological systems work that uh, Emery and Trist did. Um, but it, it, you'll see a, an explanation that later about it's not what's inside your head, it's what your head is inside. Um, we've uh, drawn a lot from post-colonial and Chinese philosophy of science. Uh, Keacock Lee uh, does a philosophy of science under classical Chinese medicine. Uh, Francois Julien is a, a French philosopher and sinologist. Uh, John Law has been studying um, Chinese doctors in Taiwan who follow the practices of um, Chinese medicine, but bill on Western codes. Uh, there's also elements of service science have come in here um, as, as, as introduced uh, in the uh, 2012 ISSS meeting. Uh, systemic design, uh, RS, uh, the RSD conference, of course, has been a big influence of this, and practice theory that drives towards communities of practice and that sort of understanding. So all this kind of gets wrapped up together, and this is the foundational um, body of work that's underneath uh, system changes learning at a theoretical level, and we're trying to put them all together. Now, one of the things that when I used to teach, when I teach ACOF, was uh, I like ACOF's idea that with authentic system thinking, synthesis precedes analysis. Synthesis means putting things together. Analysis means taking things apart. Um, now, the interesting bent, which if you stop and look at it, is that uh, if we think about um, definitions in systems, uh, one of the helpful definitions that ACOF provides is for structure and process. Structure is an arrangement in space. Process is an arrangement in time. With Western philosophy, we actually usually think about parts being in space rather than parts being in time. Um, and so it's possible to think about it uh, differently. So if we actually, so we have, yeah, have the idea here of a tree and you have sort of photosynthesis, and you're thinking, oh, you know, all this stuff is happening where a, a tree is putting, out, uh, is putting out oxygen and producing sugars and, and all that. But if you actually think over time, um, there's a nighttime that happens with uh, trees as well. And so they actually release carbon dioxide at night. Um, now, it's going to be a trick. And, and this is one of the things in, as we look deeper into um, the Chinese philosophy, is that they're actually slightly better at maintaining the parts as uh, synthesis rather than as single things. Because uh, when we take the ACOF examples, uh, 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 you can go and say, well, you take the usual example, which is uh, for a car, uh, you have a part, which is a, a carburetor or a fuel injection, but then you actually have a part. It's not from there. It's not put together. It's actually an individual part, a single thing. If you're working in Chinese philosophy, there's always two things. And so there's a change that happens. So thinking analytically, um, you loosen from the part, the holes into parts, um, but unfortunately you lose a lot of the property. So you can cut the tree down and you can look at the, uh, all of the rings in the tree to see how it's going. But when you do that, you're, you're going to lose the tree itself. So at the bottom, what we'd like to do uh, with system changes learning is we want to add the thinking about dyadically over time. Um, so the sun is waxing and waning. I had to learn waxing and waning are actually very old English words, um, but waxing means increasing in strength, waning means decreasing in strength. This contrast to uh, the, the, di the dyadic of waxing and waning is different from the dualistic Western view. The Western view would be there's sun or there's no sun. The dyadic view is there's always a little bit of sun uh, always a little bit of darkness. Uh, and so if you take the yin-yang symbol where they have the dot and uh, in the middle, uh, the dark in the middle of the light and the light in the middle of the dark, you always have that element of mixing and you have to think about it in time rather than in space. In system changes, the question would be, okay, well, one of the complaints we had, and actually I did this, uh, so I don't remember if Neelia was in, re remembers being in that lecture, which was, he started talking about that was early when we we're doing this research, and and people were saying, well, processes mean that everything changes all the time. Um, but it's like, well, 
Yes, processes happen, uh, but in living systems, we don't pay attention to most of the processes. What we're interested in usually is when there's a big change, a rhythmic shift in the texture. And the way we can think about this is uh, each one of these um, helixes we can look at as a uh, as a lifeline. And so um, Kelly's on a line, I'm on a line, Zad's on a line, and uh, Dan is on a line. And we all kind of interweave with each other. Uh, every once in a while, we make a, a jump um, and we, we cross each other, we tie knots. Um, and so this idea of texture comes out. If you think about each of our lines, each of our light, our threads, uh, lifelines um, in time, as opposed to thinking about them in space, what happens is that you can see that we come together at various points in time and we tie a knot and then we go away and we come back and tie another knot. And so that's how we make progress together. But it's the rhythmic shifts when we actually notice that something has really made a difference. If we think about, uh, again, another metaphor, um, we, at the bottom, I have a dyad. So that could be a single individual. It could be a, a single saxophone player or a single guitar player. But they blend together in a texture, uh, which is music. It's all woven together. Uh, from the perspective of a dyad, it's actually con texture because you're adding on to it. The idea of context is important, but most people misunderstand the idea of context because they think that might mean text as in words. Uh, but what if you actually look deeply into the idea of contexture, uh, it's better to uh, think about this as a weave, and if you can, a weave in time. And so when you have a shift, uh, so if one of the musicians, we're having jazz players here, if one of the musicians all of a sudden steps out of uh, a rhythm or steps out in a uh, particular chord progression, the other musicians can actually follow or not follow. And uh, you, you have them weaving together, the weave may turn out to be in a different way. Um, and so it's not just an individual inside a system where the system is fixed. It's a system that's flowing and changing over time. One of the things we have to think about, though, is causality. How do things happen? Um, there's two ways of looking at this. Uh, the Western approach we usually talk about is causality. Uh, we can think about this like water skiing. The motion happens, um, as we described with the motorboat. You have a, a boat. And you have water skis and you drag and you control most of the conditions about, you know, if the person can actually ski or not ski, get up faster, or slower. Most of those things are under the control of um, the driver. This can be compared uh, more to a Chinese philosophy that can be compared to, that can be compared to surfing. With this, we have living systems that have propensity under certain conditions. So if you go surfing, um, the surfer does not have control over the wave. Now, the surfer can decide to go out on a bad day or a good day, but they really don't control the weather. They control the waves. Uh, on top of that, though, they have the um, not they, they have the choice about whether to take the wave or not take the wave. Uh, and when they actually take the wave, there's a protocol where the um, there's other people there. And so uh, here you see a, a, a surfer getting up. Um, the, the person that's down in the water, you're going to let that person let the, let the person that's taking the lead go and they'll wait for another wave. Um, the idea of propensity comes out from Chinese philosophy. It's actually derived from the work of Sun Tzu. And it would be, uh, in his case, um, the idea that a battle is won before you even enter the field. Uh, you choose a position where you have, um, you have strength or you have a, a favorable advantage, and then you take advantage of that. And so the philosophies and the ways you're working here the difference in thinking about this, as opposed to thinking about trying to get someone on the water skiing, uh, it would be when and where is the right time to do that. It's not about the um, setting up all the conditions and getting all things together. It's much more about taking the opportunities as they come and avoiding the bad times when it's not going to happen. Now, system change is learning, and this is the hub and four spokes that's at the core of the workshop that we run. It has, uh, it starts from the middle with knowing from within. The first premise is that uh, change, systems change happens from inside systems. Um, you can't actually tell another system to change. It's not fair. Um, so the, my running joke is that uh, people have met me. I think I should lose 10 pounds or 10 kilograms, whichever the case will be. 
But the only person that's going to make that change is me. Um, people can tell me that I should lose weight or not lose weight. Um, but the knowing from within, it's like, oh, I feel heavy. You know, I think I should probably lose some weight. That's going to be something that I, I have to decide on myself. Now, there's four parts associated with that. If I go north, there's recognizing the contextual influences, the contextual influences. So what's happening in the world outside of me that might cause me to, um, to uh, change or know from within that something is happening? Um, and uh, it could be, uh, I just came back from, uh, from Spain, so I've had a, I'm not sleeping very well. I know that I'm actually not as sharp as I usually am. You can say, well, not, not such a surprise. You have jet lag and you came with all, these context, all this context of, of having your time zones changed. Um, from there, we go to the uh, right, uh, diagnosing rhythmic disorders. We now start to take more of a medical um, metaphor or simile. This is that we, we're trying to learn from medical practice. And here, the question would be, what are the rhythms that have changed and how would you express that something is wrong? Um, and so it could be, uh, uh, for, for me, coming back from Spain, I'm going to, I'm getting very tired at night. Uh, I'm waking up way too early. There's obviously rhythms that have changed there and um, uh, it's a problem. So, you know, that's the diagnosis. That's what's wrong with the system. Going to the South, uh, prognosing likelihoods. Uh, this is something when you actually look at the medical literature, doctors often jump from diagnosing to prescribing or, 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 or recommending treatments too quickly, but they should actually be reviewing the, the prognosis. These are alternative ways of moving forward. So um, if I'm trying to get over jet lag, it's like, well, you know, how should I handle that? Should I handle it by taking drugs? Should I handle it by exercising? Should I handle it by eating in a different pattern? There are all these sorts of things that I could do. And what I do is uh, I take the likelihood. What's the likelihood, you know, if I change my eating pattern that it's going to actually improve my jet lag? Or what's the probability that if I, I um, that if I, you know, I, I try to sleep or can stay up, whatever, that's going to work or don't work. And so there's multiple paths we go through there. Um, the final act, which is on the left, is a reordering of pacing. And this is actually consciously making commitments to actually change that. Um, so I'm, I'm actually trying to reorder my pacing. I'm uh, back in writing mode, so I don't want to switch completely into the Eastern time that we've been having. I want to actually go to bed at nine o'clock so I can wake up early. So this, I'm taking part of the uh, jet lag as an advantage to actually uh, reorder the pacing of my whole day. The workshop that we stat that we had with the uh, with Code for Canada uh, for the Canadian Digital Service, I, this, these are actually the workshop slides we used. And so the first first unit was knowing from within. The guiding questions we asked: What rhythmic shifts are most present to you? Um, what what's your system of interest uh, that you can and should know? And then the harder question: What are the two dyadic processes that carry on sustaining, synthesizing to uh, sustain your living? And there's a yin and yang explanation of yang is working, dissipating or expanding. Yin is resting, materializing or contracting. So it, at this point, facilitators have to understand this more than the people do. We have some examples. Okay, so here's an example of, of, of a shift from pandemic working at home on family life. Okay, so what rhythmic shifts are more present to you? So knowing from within that there's something that's really changed. Um, when we went into the pandemic, all of a sudden, people were living at home and working in closer quarters. So uh, before it used to be, you might escape a small apartment to go to a co-working space. When they close that down, now you're working in a, a very small apartment. Um, the easy conveniences that you have, like you know, just going out for food or something like that, you'd have to start re doing resource planning because grocery stores were not open all the time, and you'd have to uh, figure out where, which stores are open, what days, what store, what hours are open, those sorts of things. Uh, second, what's your system of interest that you can and should know and can and adapt and or learn? Um, it was, we said at a household level, you can make changes. Of course, you can do it individual level, but practically, if you're living with people in, in your home, uh, you may have kids that have to make the adjustments. Your spouse have to make an adjustment, uh, but it's not at a household level. So thirdly, which two dyadic processes carry on synthesizing and sustain life? And so 
Um, there's the idea of working, and uh, it, it's uh, we're trying to figure the right word for this. But if you try to think of yin and yang, working would be yang, providing income, domesticizing, homemaking, keeping, uh, taking care of your uh, home is actually yin. And so it's a combination. If you're actually making the change, it's not just um, working, working changes, other things happening in your life, and they balance off more work, less homemaking. You go back and forth between the two. Another example. Um, suppose you're creating a software app for venue vaccination tracking. Uh, so uh, one of the things during the pandemic was that um, businesses were asked to keep track of people visiting, um, but there was no app built. So if we're going to build an app, how would we do that? So what rhythmic shift would be most present to you? Uh, so the shift that's happening is that visitors would normally come into a store and you didn't have to register. You just come into the store, and but now you're going to track them. Um, the venue would be checking and recording names at the door. That's actually a pretty big shift of uh, that was happening during the pandemic. Which is your system of interest that you can and should know and can adapt or learn? Um, civic Tech was act associated with Code for Canada, and it could be an organization um, that could volunteer and get together and uh, potentially build something. What are the dyadic processes? Um, there's the process of privileging access of personal records for entry, so taking the names, but then there's also another process, which is a right to be forgotten. So the idea would be that a store should actually, yes, record the number the, the people who have come into the store, but after the uh, incubation period of COVID, why would you be storing them? And so you have a right to be forgotten. So looking at the yin and yang of things actually helps in, uh, of, of you think of things in a different way. Now, this is when we get into a little bit of exercise about yin and yang, understanding what it means. And this requires a lot of effort um, on for, for Westerners who aren't familiar with yin and yang. Uh, I, as someone who was a Western trained, this is one of those things that my grandmother would say is obvious. And it's kind of like, it's not obvious to me at all. So yang would be like illuminating versus yin darkening. Um, the way they normally talk about yin and yang would be as light and dark. But as processes, we end up changing these into verb tenses. Uh, so yang is working, yin is resting, yang is warming, yin is cooling, yang is deci rising, descending, dissipating, materializing, scattering, congealing. Now, so the what happens is that the yang tends to be immaterial and the yin tends to be material. And that's one of the interesting things as we start thinking about it. So thinking about things are actually yang. Uh, doing something and actually creating a change in the world is actually yin, and you need both. Now, we're not interested in all in, in all of yin and yang, um, but we need a little bit of education about yin and yang. Um, and, and leaning on, on classical Chinese medicine is good because there's a lot of doctors out there. And the first thing that you learn about this is that uh, yin and yang change continuously, and this is a lot different from the most most people think about systems. But if we start at the left side at dawn, yin, yang and yin are balanced, um, and uh, your body actually uh, naturally is um, at rest or in balance at that point. What happens is your energy rises and your yang rises. So at noon you got maximum yang. Uh, at dusk your yang comes down again, and then at midnight your yin is at maximum. And so this is normal process change. And so we're talking about systems change. This is a normal change within a system, but these aren't the ones we actually worry about. What we worry about are actually the exceptions to this. If I look in the upper left, we have the idea of excess yang, full heat. And this is when, uh, in effect, the system is running too hot. Um, the yin is lower than the yang. Um, and so the yang is outside of the normal range. The yin is within normal range, but relatively speaking, it's it's high. Uh, and so uh, in Chinese medicine, because you've got these things happening during the day, uh, you actually go from excess yang, a full heat, into deficient yin, which is empty heat. And so the yang will come down, and that would actually be at somewhat a normal range, but then the yin would be way below the normal range. Uh, on the opposite side, on the right side, you can have excess cold, too much yin, um, and then you get the deficient yin or the empty cold. And so when we're thinking about this, and this was the interesting part as we we're working through uh, with the Canadian Digital Service, was, okay, uh, do you have any of these symptoms in your organization 
where in effect you're running too hot or you're running too cold. And these are software development teams. And so they they took it to heart and they actually worked their way through it uh, and came up with some interesting answers. Uh, one of the uh, responses that came back was uh, the uh, idea about development versus maintenance. And so um, uh, they they were actually doing a lot of development work and they actually felt they were not spending enough time in maintenance, which is a case of excess yang is they're just working a lot and building new new products, but they're not actually maintaining the old ones. And so the uh, the resolution of this would be, well, you should actually focus on that and, um, and, uh, and try to rebalance the yin and yang. Now, in looking through the contextual influences, um, this was, if you're going through the hubs, we're going up to the um, north uh, in, the, uh, in the four axes, um, not everything uh, when people talk about systems, we always have this, sometimes have this mistaken idea that everything is connected to everything. Uh, you could say everything is connected to everything, but some things are closer than others. And the way we can think about this is actually uh, as local and distant if you're doing this in space and urgent and important if you're doing this in time. And so uh, most people tend to focus on the uh, lower left uh, which is local and urgent activities. Um, and so if you're on the battlefield and uh, someone gets injured, you call up the medics, you know, the medics actually treat you on the battlefield, that is local and urgent. Not everything in the world is local and urgent. Uh, we tend to uh, not, not think about the things that are on the upper right that are distant and important. So uh, if you have a uh, rhythmic shift that's like an operating room, uh, an operating room is important um, and they can schedule it because people aren't going to die if you don't uh, uh, work on them the next 10 minutes. Um, and it requires a lot more planning. Um, but uh, And so not everything has to be done on the battlefield. You can do things on the operating room. There's the other two cases as well in the upper left um, where you have urgent and distant uh, trauma centers are actually that. Um, if, if you've ever been in an accident, they may not send you to the closest hospital. They may send you to the trauma center. Um, and if you have the then the lower uh, right, there are cases where it's local and important. And so um, uh, having neighborhood clinics as we do uh, for normal checkups and things like that is something that is an important activity that can run locally. You don't need an emergency room to do that. So these are the type of uh, influences and you can work through those. Uh, I'm going to jump to the end of the workshop um, and uh, having stepped through all the four um, uh, and all the materials are available on the uh, systemchanges.com um, website. Uh, we asked, well, you know, what did you learn during the workshop? What more do you need to learn? Uh, which options do you choose? Which path do you disfavor? Which favor? What actions are next? And so in a three-hour workshop, we were able to go through all that. So we're going to, we've been talking for a while. I'm going to pause here and uh, stop the screen share. Um, and I can ask Dan uh, if there's any questions, if you would actually facilitate um, chat. Dan? Yep. Okay. So if people have questions, you can raise your hands or the other way to do it, probably preferred, is to put something in the chat so we can prioritize properly. It's blasting along here, these people. Great presentation, David. Okay, thanks. What would you do with it? <laughs> what would I do with it? I, I, I think that I, I'm not quite sure the why, but but I certainly know that that maybe maybe it's just because I've I've heard parts of it before, but it seemed really uh, concrete in a much more uh, cohesive way. I'm not I'm not quite sure why, but hopefully I can get back to you on that one. <laughs> I think it's one of those things that, um, and it's that's why we're on a year four of a ten year journey. Is that uh, we fundamentally have the um, the theoretical uh, ideas worked out. The wording that we're using may not be the best wording. Um, this was the the pilot workshop, and so uh, and um, uh, the ideas of yin and yang. We've it, it's 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 tough. Uh, you know, would we not call it yin yang, call it something else? Is there another way of presenting it? There could be ways of doing that. Um, right now, I'm trying to um, align the practice with the theory. 
uh, but that's being pure. So um, if practitioners actually decide that's not going to work, then that's up to them for the situation. So actually, David, Ian has a pretty good question that's related to the uh, dilemma that you're facing. There, maybe Ian could um, provide that. Does Ian want to? Oh, I can't hear you. Can't hear you, Ian. I think you can hear me now, though. Yep. Um, so just hearing you speak through the yin and the yang uh, framework, it reminds me of polarities work and wondering if like, what's the connection between, like, because when I think of polarities, they become important ones that you cannot favor either, but must pay attention to both, even though they seem um, contradicting. Um, so, so philosophically, and, and the, the, the best work for this is actually Keacock Lee's um, philosophy of science, uh, of, of the philosophy of science of um, classical Chinese medicine, um, is, is that firstly, uh, if we look at change, so the, when we first started doing the research in, in the system changes, it's like everything is processes, um, which is good. Uh, and, that, and that itself is a big uh, jump to, go, to get to processes. Um, but when we start going into, um, into in effect, rhythms, um, then it's like, okay, that's, that's more than processes. Um, and then the question as to how rhythms interact with each other. Uh, so um, when you're talking about polarities, polarities, they tend to be, well, when you they say polar, like be positive or negative maximum or or black or white, like there's the idea in the West is that there's absolute black and there's absolute white. Um, and that's not a process orientation per se. So you could say, well, or an ultimate lightning, uh, but when the lightning happens, there's still a little bit of darkening in it. And so there's, there's, a, there's a real trick in getting wrapped around it. Um, I have to say that uh, what, as I've been understanding it better, and it's been a couple of years we've been working on this now, um, the, the, the first thing was I presented this in the first year of the System Changes Learning Circle. They threw me out of the room because it was like, oh, no, this doesn't make any sense. Um, so it's taken the, uh, the, the people within the circle a while to learn this. Um, the, the idea of polarity, um, I'd have to see, like if you, if you thought of polarity like alternating current, um, then I'm not, I, I'd have to think about whether that actually works or not, because it, it is a cycle. Um, but we're actually talking about living systems, not mechanical systems. So then you start getting into these sorts of nuances. So you've, you asked yeah. a very hard question for which I'm trying to struggle on an answer. Does that help? Well, it, it helps, but I guess it's also, because I think of uh, Barry Johnson's work around polarities, about the, the shift, the continual shifting that happens between them. And that you have to understand both the, the sort of the positive and degenerative sides of any of, of any of both sides, and that it's the movement between, not the sort of either the stasis or staying in one or the other. Yeah, I, I'm not familiar with that work, so it'd be it's tough for me yeah. to comment on that. Yeah, if you could okay. drop a link in the chat, we can look it up afterwards. Thanks. Thank you. So I think Nanad was next. If he wants to. Um, first of all, David, uh, um, amazing presentation. I, I really loved it. And um, thank you very much also for the reference to Francois Julien and uh, his, um, I think it's called European Chinese Lexicon, is, is a great place to start in trying to figure out all different kind of concepts, some of which you presented, but also in general how, you know, different uh, cultural backgrounds and philosophies develop patterns in which we think nowadays at least from, you know, Socrates or Plato onwards, if not before him. Um, and um, I just wanted to, to ask you something because in terms of yin yang, and maybe I'm going too far, you know, just, you know, cut me off if that's too much, but, you know, I, I know a bit about Chinese medicine and yin yang is sometimes understood, uh, understood as relative to, I mean, the basic example is that humans are yin in comparison to the heavens, and then we are yang, in comparison to yin. So that, would that complicate what you presented or it, would it actually make more sense? I'm just, just a probing there, thanks. Okay, yeah, so, so this is where Keacock Lee is really helpful because her model is contextual dyadic thinking. And so the yin yang happens within a context. And the question is, what is that context? Um, and, uh, 
and so um she she makes the joke that you can't judge a cat and a dog show and a, a dog and a cat show and so the context changes um in in her book she actually talks about how um in in a western sense there's always one that is stronger so like masculine feminine uh, and so masculine in effect is the uh, superior and feminine is the inferior and in in the chinese philosophy it's well there's both so you can't have masculine without feminine um this this is actually a, an interesting problem and in, in presenting this content before um uh, uh you know anyone who's feminist is like no no <laughs> there's a whole philosophy behind this i'm not attacking feminism per se it's that you have to have both and it's the balance between and and masculine and feminine also doesn't mean male and female because all of us have masculine and feminine in the yin yang sense right um so uh so um yeah yin yang is tricky and it, it takes a while and um uh, as we're working through these workshops we each of us have to prepare uh and i have to say that i had zad correct me about oh no that's yang not yin uh, because as we go through it we make our own mistakes through this Thank you. Uh, Lena, I think, was next. If he wants to go. Are you there, Lena? On mute there. I'm not sure if you're... He's gone away or not. I don't know. See, it looks like she's... The uh, video's off. Why don't we... Oh, there. Is she coming? Mm -hmm. Oh, she yeah. was. I know. She... Elena, do you want to... Okay, why don't... Uh, there you yeah. go. Good. I'm here. Good. <laughs> Why don't you go ahead, dear next, and then we'll go to Aisha. <clears throat> okay. I was uh, wondering about the idea of yin and yang, depending on one's role or perspective. And when housework was mentioned, I was thinking of the difference between doing housework for your own house and somebody who's doing the same work for pay. And I wondered if it was all down to role and perception. That, that's part of the context. And so the, that, that's where the contextual dyadic comes in. Um, and so it, it's, it's helpful. Uh, so Keacock, he's a real philosopher. I, I only play in philosophy. I try to avoid it when I can, but I've kind of fallen into it. And so she would say the context matters. So the context of working for someone else, you're in someone else's house, you're getting paid for it. That's a different context. That's work. Um, yeah. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> and great presentation, by the way. Thanks. Aisha, do you want to go next? Hi, David. Thank you so much. You know, uh, just, just before this meeting, I was in my MRP meeting with Dr. Shara Diamond, and I'm researching the future of mindfulness in the metaverse. And this is so relevant. I wasn't expecting this, but this is exactly what we were discussing, that how Eastern traditions are different and Western traditions are different. And the understanding of mindfulness as a meditation practice or maybe as a psychological practice varies as well. Um, so I think this sort of framework would be extremely helpful in helping me create a system, you know, um, in terms of navigating through the new technology. So that's yeah. one comment. And uh, so if, if I could have these resources somewhere, would, would access be available or I could reach out to you later? with more specific questions that would be amazing thank you yeah um, yeah, yeah we we have regular meetings of system changes learning circle so you can hit me or zad up or kelly or dan and join one of them and we'll just have a discussion uh, it's not a problem yeah um on on, on the idea so there, there's a lot going on because um the 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 approach we're taking as much as uh, we're trying to introduce a yin yang into the systems lexicon because um, like I, I, I come down through the Acoff Churchman, uh, <laughs> uh, the pragmatic American um, uh, philosophies. And, and it's trying interesting to break away from that and going, well, we should, if we're going to expand the field of system sciences, we should draw in from other places. And uh, so uh, Chinese philosophy, Chinese medicine is one of those places. But the interesting part of it is not just um going west versus east in effect it's actually looking for that blend and so uh the idea of post-colonial science uh, uh, and that that's come up from the work of john law uh is really interesting and we can i get to the references offline um but the the idea that in taiwan 
they do both Western and uh, Chinese medicine is really great. Um, so how do you do that? And it's only in Taiwan that they really do that. They you do it in Canada too, kind of, but it's really a Western oriented um, practice here. Um, so post-colonial is an idea that we've been developing within the system changes learning circle. We haven't gotten all the way through it yet, but that's part of the things that we're exploring is, is how do we mix. And in Canada, we actually have quite an advantage of doing this. Uh, as I was saying, I came back from Spain and, and uh, making the claim that people, you might find people that can, uh, in Spain, who could trace themselves back to the Romans, <laughs> the ancient Romans, you know, 100 uh, AD or something. Um, but in the new world, we can tend to blend these things a little better. Yeah. I think Zad has a next question. Well, actually, I'm, I'm not oh. sure if Asia has finished, but. Oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah, no, I just wanted to comment that I think generally in the Eastern world, from the Oriental traditions, the Western uh, medicine and uh, indigenous, I don't know if that's the right word, but I would say Oriental traditions of medicine are very inherently combined and practiced in those cultures. I think it's really a problem of the dichotomy is just the Western problem and not really an Oriental problem. Uh, we yeah. are very blended. In our, in our ways of thinking. And yeah. the next comment I wanted to make was that thank you for clarifying the process and structure because we were working on the climate change map, um, which we just exhibited in the RSD 11. And it's very hard to explain how they, they differ even to team members because people don't have that understanding that how a process is different and the yeah. structure is different in system change. So thank so, you. So so, so for some of that, um, since I used to teach in that class, so there, I, I have a YouTube channel where the lectures, the prior lectures from OCAD are, are all there. Um, and so you hear me say various things. And so the running joke was that before 2019, I used to teach all ACOF stuff. And so on the channel, you'll see me teaching function, structure, process, behavior, these sorts of things. And now we've actually switched where I'm teaching that less. Uh, I, actually, I actually just cited that in the... Um, the, uh, in a lecture I did last week, I got the two lectures in Barcelona. The first one was the introductory one where it says, okay, I'm going to teach you what everyone else teaches you. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about system changes learning and how it's different. Um, so it's not that we don't know that. And again, it's a blending of the two that we'll be looking at in the longer term. Oh, okay. I guess Zad's on now. <laughs> Thanks, Dan. <clears throat> Thank you, David, for the presentation. It's always good to revisit some stuff. Uh, I'll ask the question and then I'll give some contexture around the question, which is, does the post-colonial framing invite a better approach to idealization versus practical or pragmatic? That's the question. And the context around the question is, as I start to nerd out more on history and the blurriness between East and West, it's really difficult to like really separate that thread. You know, you can go to a different era of time where ideas in the American constitution are not necessarily Western in and of themselves and Eastern ideas, et cetera. You even have, you even have interesting maps where people would craft a map of the world upside down from the medieval Islamic era, or you can, you can put Australia at the center of the world and it's massive. There's all these ways to perceive uh, the direction. And so the East and West um, dichotomy often doesn't work. And so I really like the post-colonial framing. And when it, when it, the background conversation that we've been having that others may not have is this idea of how do you work through striving towards an ideal versus dealing with the practical reality at hand. And I just wonder that now I'm circling back to the question. I wonder if the post-colonial framing from a application standpoint of the, of the doctors, the practitioners in Taiwan, you were saying, does that, do you think that that allows them to find that balance between ideal and practical? Um, I'm going to answer this and then I'm going to punt to David Hawk for an answer, but uh, let me, let me um, tell you what's happening and, and what's kind of the deeper thinking and the practical um, for this. So the, the, um, the, the practical and the reason for the medical metaphor is that people actually um, kind of understand going to the doctor. Uh, but there's all these things that happen around medicine that people don't think about. One is that you you hurt, you feel pain, but then you don't go to the doctor. 
Um, and then you go to the doctor and you doctor diagnoses you, but then you don't do anything. <laughs> so there's all these practices we think about, uh, but it, in, in essence, if we think about the body as a system, um, then it's like, well, you know, how is it that we actually make the changes? Now, some of these changes are actually mental changes. Um, and we talk about learning in the mental sense or the cognitive sense, but some of it in the larger uh, idea of systems is that the the organism learns, like your your body learns to adapt to um, COVID or the cold or you know whatever. So there's learning in that sense. So um, what happens when I'm taking the medical metaphor, and this is the more philosophical part, is I'm actually avoiding the ideal idealization. I'm actually talking about a system that's broken or an undesirable state. I'm not trying to become an Olympic athlete. Um, David Hawk, would you like to comment on on idealization and um, and maybe because um, Akoff was big on ideals? Yeah, I could I could maybe try, <clears throat> uh, maybe even bringing in Akoff's uh, notion about medicine, healthcare, and the whole process that you're trying to make sense of relative to yin and yang. But Akoff was quite adamant that you cannot have uh, making money as part of healthcare, that you guarantee that healthcare is irrelevant, that in essence, sickness is the crucial variable. So you must keep people as sick as long as possible within a system that's based on profit and money. And in essence, it becomes a causal relationship of fixing people up and not too much. And so the objective is not so crucial to make them well, but to keep them living so you make money. And a little bit of that was carried over into the uh, design of a new uh, healthcare university in Southern China in Guangzhou. And uh, near Guangzhou, there's an island just off of the city where a new university was built. I think they invested about $2 billion equivalent in building this university, where an important part of it was the medical or medicine part. And going back to what you mentioned before, that in essence, they really wanted to take the advantages of Eastern and Western medicine into a more, shall we say, systemic, uh, holistic approach. And so in this regard, they built, if you will, two campuses with a street in between, meaning the architecture uh, on one side was Eastern medicine, on the other side was Western medicine. And so those two architectural edifices got to face each other over a street and deal with how to integrate what uh, the West thinks is healthcare and what the East has long thought was healthcare. And, and it was quite, quite an interesting place. Even the architecture was quite interesting. I don't know how it's turned out since then, but early on, uh, yin and yang discussions were very important across the street and what they meant on both sides of the street. And so the issues you're raising, I think are terribly important. And so much so that a great deal of money, energy, human capital was invested in this new kind of university. Um, I, I don't know how much success they had, but I think it was somewhat interesting. And some place in there, they had mentioned Akoff and he wrote a few chapters on healthcare which they thought really epitomized what's wrong with Western healthcare. And so how to get over that and give some credence to healthcare that didn't have profit as the objective. And I, I don't know how far they went with that, but I think they asked the right questions. I, I don't know what answers they finally arrived at. And I, I sort of, uh, went off elsewhere and didn't go back and visit after a while. But th they were with you. Let's see, this was in the 90s that they built the campus, built the architecture and put the people in place. And it was very interesting. 
I don't know why no one has reported on it since that I know of. So maybe that's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps it's a good thing. Uh, next time I'm in Guangzhou, I, I will go visit the place and, and see if there's any healthy live people walking around. Not yeah. sure if that, that helps, but, it, but th there's many other issues relative to what you're trying to grapple with that I like very much. And one, as you sort of know, is how to move relative to climate change, how to move beyond cause effect thinking and how to get people to begin to think of effects of effects instead of causes of effects. And in that we may lose that game and, and the causes may not be so significant anymore. And then what does that mean relative to healthcare? And I'm, I'm a little bit at a loss. Um, David, remember my second wife, Barbara? Did you ever meet her? No. She died today. Oh. And so I'm sort of sitting here contemplating what does healthcare mean relative to her life as a nurse and all the things that she fought for and cared about. And so I'm, I'm a little bit at a loss to try and think, what the hell would she say about what we're talking about, thinking about, dealing with? And uh, so I'm, I'm a little, a little bit on another planet just now. Sorry. Okay. okay. Thanks, David. So, so the actually, so it turns out that the um, the reason that uh, I was working with um, uh, Ryan. Ali, uh, uh, Ryan at the University of Barcelona is he's put out a call for papers that's actually focused on uh, the shifts that happened according to pandemic. But I'm actually looking to think that maybe it's not just pandemic we should be looking at, it should also be climate change. And so uh, I'll be looking into this framework in the next couple of months. Uh, and in, in effect, we'd have to actually think about how uh, a system is sick or not sick. Um, so answering your question a little bit more, Zad, uh, buried in some of this thinking is uh, a, a lot of the uh, system changes work that I've seen is let's change people's minds. So we have the right idea. We'll just get more people on board and we'll change their minds and then the whole system will change. And it's like, no, we can't even do that. Like I can't even lose 10 pounds. Right. <laughs> it's like so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not sick enough. If I got sick enough, all of a sudden it'd be like, oh, no, no, I really need to change my behavior. Like I, I went vegan um, a couple of years ago because it was medical. So the reason I'm vegan is not because uh, I hate to say I'm not because I'm an environmentalist is actually that the uh, the medical fact came up. I need to lower my cholesterol. And within three weeks, it was like, oh, it's fixed. Going vegan fixes cholesterol. That's uh, that's a rhythmic shift that I made. That's a decision that I made. Right. Dad? So just to go back, like um, the medical metaphor you choose to use is because it has an everyday resonance or relevance of a, of a its starting point is non-ideal. Its starting point is that there's something off, there's something sick. Yes. And so what you're, does the body of work that you're presenting then, you're saying that it may not apply to those who strive towards ideals or who haven't identified what's sick like this is there a case where this does it where is this not useful uh, so again that's that's another paper i'm working on uh and i'm looking uh, so i'm actually looking at combining the panarchy model with the yin yang model um and in effect i'm focused on the traps um and, I, and so you may have noticed i blogged on the traps recently and that's because i was reviewing the literature on 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 four types of traps. And most people will only know about two types of traps. I only knew about two types of traps and also I'm doing the research. Oh, there's four types of traps. Uh, so there's lots more work to be done. We're not, we're not done yet. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So, I, so I'm gonna continue on with some more slides. Um, so the, the point at we, which you, we've gotten now is that um, if you were a attendee at a workshop, it's kind of like, this is the warm up. We could actually get you through the workshop. And there's two more levels beyond that. Um, there's a, a level at which the facilitators need to get at and a stronger theoretical understanding. And then beyond that is actually the methods development that happens. So let me share my screen and uh, share screen, this screen. 
share and start the slideshow from here. Okay, so thinking, um, action learning for facil facilitators. Okay, so there's um, there's multiple depths at which we're doing system changes learning. Uh, first, we want to reorient the attention of the people. Um, and this is all the nuances we have in, you know, so example, the medical metaphor. When I, I slide you into the medical metaphor, uh, medical simile is actually a better description. The medical simile, um, what I'm doing is I'm actually derailing you from thinking idealistically, but I'm not doing that overtly, just kind of slide it in. Uh, but when we get that, then we get uh, into, um, well, so let me go, go, go across the first, first row. Uh, so we have the ideas about praxis, which is doing, theory of thinking and poesis making. And so educating attention firstly is, um, is trying to understand the behavioral and the ecolo or, and, and or the ecological. And this is trying to understand the attention. Behavioral is looking inside the system, ecological is looking outside the system. I'll explain a little bit more in a moment, but people often think about mostly the behavioral and looking inside the system and we can look outside the system as well. Um, in theory, the educating attention is changelessness versus temporality. When people think about, about change and systems change, are they thinking about a one-time change that in effect puts you into another changeless state? Or are they thinking about temporality where you would actually you know, go and uh, go multi-generations? I'm just thinking about this. It's kind of like, you know, are you thinking about your about having children or are you thinking about having grandchildren and children after that, you know, great, great grandchildren, temporality along that way? And then in the poesis, the educating of attention is away from the causality and more towards propensity. And, and one of the ideas here with a, a systems approach is that if you have a living system, the living system will exert choice. It will actually not necessarily behave the way you want it to behave. So um, this is actually attacking the idea of a leverage point um, in, implicitly that uh, people talk about leverage points, but it's like, does that point want to be leveraged? Or could you just find out someone that's actually just ready to make that change themselves and educate and, and direct your attention towards that? Um, I'm going to skip the, the bottom of the slides for now, but I, I'll talk about the top ones. Okay, so uh, this is a distinction that came up in, uh, in, in on looking and trying to advance through, uh, uh, advance the system sciences. Uh, and a lot of the work that I've been looking at had been uh, on affordances originally. And this led me to J.J. Uh, Gibson. And so J.J. Gibson um, is known for the ecological approach to perception. And it was like, okay, so what, what do they mean by that? Um, and so the, the simplest answer for this is that behavioral psychology asks, what's inside your head? An ecological approach asks, what's your head inside of? And so if we look back at the period, because this is actually psychology, when the psychology is under development, is a stimulus response, behavioral psychology, they have, say, uh, Pavlov's dog, you ring the bell and the dog salivates. They're trying to figure out what's happening inside your head. If you actually look at J.J. Gibson's research, what he was focused on was uh, how does a pilot land an aircraft on a carrier in, in the ocean? No matter how much you study what's going on inside the pilot's head, it really doesn't help. What you have to do is look at the perception of the pilot and they watch the ship when you've got the, the, uh, uh, the aircraft moving at the same time. And so you're, you're looking at the external world. Now, if you look at this in terms of systems, the left side tends to be you have a hole and then you've got parts and you're actually trying to figure out what are the parts are inside of the hole. On the right side, you're actually looking at whole-whole relations. And this is really tricky. You've got an aircraft that's a hole and you've got a uh, carrier that's a hole and they're both moving at the same time. And so you've got all that happening. So um, this actually shows up. And, and so when you see the word ecological, Ecological is not what people think it really means. Ecological actually means this, that it's outside what your head is inside of. It's an external view. Um, and so uh, the, the, the both are valid, but if we're looking uh, as an example at, um, at uh, Emory and Trist's work um, that was happening when, when they went from socio-technical systems into socio-ecological systems, the left was more socio-technical systems theory 
the right would be more socio-ecological systems theory. So the 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 term ecological. Um, hope that people will think about that and actually think about maybe you could actually present and think about ecology in a different way. Now, the, the getting down to the philosophical uh, question about changelessness, the question comes down to, uh, and it goes back to the ancient Greeks, is what is reality? Is reality those things that don't change or are, is reality things that do change? And we end up here, and David Hawke is the one that's led me through most of this work, um, the difference between Parmenides and Heraclitus. Uh, by moving to a Chinese philosophy, we're actually in the right side. And so this is part of the problem when we start talking about the way that we, we think about change, um, is that if you're on the left side, you think about change from one state to another state. Uh, for those of you who have done uh, uh, consulting work, it's always the... Uh, as is model and the to be model. You make one change at a time. Um, the alternative would be to look at reality of the state of change, which is we got change happening all the time. Where can we introduce little uh, nudges here and there, um, little changes that would make a difference in the end? On top of this, within Chinese philosophy, we have the idea of Wei and Wu Wei. Wei is best translated as willful action. Wu Wei is non-obtrusive, non-intrusive action. Um, a bad translation of Wu Wei is doing nothing. Um, that's not a good translation. Wu Wei would be to have work to work with nature. Um, I find parallels with the work that uh, Tim Allen had done in supply side sustainability. He says, provide that which nature does not provide itself. That's the idea of sustainability. Um, I'm making jokes that uh, I've been traveling a lot with my uh, my spouse, Diana, uh, and uh, Diana actually looks after me. It's actually in her nature. She's a protector. And so I can uh, be guaranteed that I won't get into so much trouble if I travel with her as opposed to traveling without her because she looks out for me. Um, my, my sons actually um, uh, think that she, uh, they think that she's sometimes nagging, but I say, unfortunately, sometimes she's right. And so um, it's in her nature, and I try to take advantage of her nature. It's something she does without asking. Okay, making. Okay, um, this is actually the summary of the uh, ISSS conference um, presentation, which is uh, when we actually think about a philosophy, how do we judge that philosophy? Um, and uh, it actually comes down. So uh, uh, we're working. This this applies the idea of appreciative systems. So across the top, um, Jeffrey Vickers suggested that there are three judgments that we make: reality, what is real, uh, what is the state of what happens today. Uh, we then make a value judgment: uh, what should the world be, and how do we want it? And then we have an instrumental judgment: how do we get from where we are to where we want to be? Um, and what it means to do that. When we start working across philosophies, we have implicit sorts of things happening. So the first one, I was, I was spending a lot of time in the philosophy of architectural design, looking at the work of Christopher Alexander and in pattern language. What's the reality for a, an architect? Um, and these are these are my statements um, that, that I'm uh, trying to present. So I would say that what's real for Christopher Alexander is differentiating space. Uh, Christopher Alexander says he's a building architect. Uh, he, he does not do social systems per se. People that do pattern language with social systems, he says, that's up to you. That's not really what I'm doing. The value judgment that he has uh, is uh, he's trying to create living order, which is quality without a name. The instrumental judgment, the way he does that, he looks at unfolding patterns. Uh, he was dipping a lot into Eastern philosophies, uh, a lot working with the Japanese. And the idea of Wu Wei would actually come, um, uh, that would coincide with this is, can you actually work with nature so that things uh, improve over time or or happen the way that you would like them to work? Um, there's constructing, repairing, and there's an article he wrote on systems generating systems in 1967. Um, it's taken a while to figure out what that means. But uh, if you look at Christopher Alexander's work on pattern language, it's on uh, towns, uh, it's, on, it's on buildings and towns, uh, neighborhoods, these sorts of things. Uh, he would construct buildings, but the buildings are systems that generate a town or a neighborhood. 
And so he working, he's working from the bottom up. And, uh, and the question is, well, could you actually generate be a beautiful town by generating beautiful houses? Uh, you run to those sorts of questions. Uh, in ecological anthropology, in the word of, work of Tim Ingold, J.J. Gibson, what's the reality there? Uh, for Tim Ingold, he has talked about lines of becoming, which are the lifelines I talked about. So he's talking about time and individuals and how they work together and get tied in knots. And meshworks, where you have multiple people you know, tying knots and using that metaphor. Um, the value judgment he has, continuity of living alongside other beings. And so for him, living systems is quite important, but it's living um, in the sense that um, people don't really think about. And a, a good example that he writes about is um, citing um, John Knight with the Second Life of Trees, uh, that in Japan, in the upland forest, the tradition has been that the uh, forester looks after a tree for 30 years um, and then cuts down the tree and the tree becomes part of a house. And so in effect, the tree looks after the family for 30 years. Um, and it's a cycle that works. And so this is not the usual way we think about living systems. Uh, the instrumental judgment is a form giving as weaving. Um, and how do you actually create that meshwork of uh, living beings together? Uh, philosophy of classical Chinese medicine. The reality is that diseases are internal. Uh, one of the things I learned from my Chinese doctor who published a book on internal Chinese medicine, I asked him, is there an external Chinese medicine? And he laughed. Uh, so Chinese medicine is actually not ecological. It is purely internal medicine, but they recognize external causes. Um, there's interesting discussions about uh, dispelling winds and these sorts of things that happen. Uh, the value judgments, Wei and Wu Wei, uh, a Chinese doctor will actually try to work with the, natu the nature in your body. Uh, when I first went to the doctor, um, he said that, uh, um, in effect, he was trying to stimulate my kidney. He said, though, but your, your kidney may be lazy, so it may not respond to the herbs we're giving you. He's trying to work with the, uh, the body in the way it is. Um, instrumental judgments, um, you sequence treating the root or the manifestations. Uh, so the question is, do you treat the symptoms or do you treat the root problems? Um, and uh, in some cases, ideally, you'd like to be able to treat the root problems, but if someone is in so much pain or they're bleeding, you have to treat the symptoms first. Um, and so you can work through that. Then they have the process of tonifying yin or yang or expelling pathogenic factors. Those are the four, um, four ways that you would approach uh, each one of those um, uh, four disorders. Uh, philosophy of rhythm. Uh, philosophy of rhythm is actually underdeveloped. Uh, mostly Henri Lefebvre has done a good job on this and some work has been done in music. Um, the reality for them is repetition and time as kairos. Kairos is felt time as opposed to chronos, that is clock time. Uh, the value judgment they have is looking for collective polyrhythmia. This is particularly with the work of Henri Lefebvre. And um, the question as to uh, whether that's individual arrhythmia or arrhythmia. So you have individuals that are not working within the uh, collective and can you correct them? Um, the instrumental judgment is, do you actually then <clears throat> take an individual out of the collective um, or do you actually improve their skills so that they can actually become part of the whole, all rhythmists? And so the uh, proposal that I have um, for a philosophy of system changes is that the reality is rhythmic shifts in textures. The value judgment is about propensities and the instrumental judgment is about reordering pacing. So that's how everything kind of ties together um, and the path on how we got here. Um, I have lots of blogging on um, coevolving.com. Um, and let's see. Okay, so a lot of this work is actually uh, based off uh, Tim Ingold's work on this. When we start looking at uh, ecological anthropology, uh, Tim Ingold actually extends the work of Gregory Bateson uh, and makes it clearer, uh, uh, which is good. Um, and so the idea of organism, organism plus environment uh, one of the subtle things in system changes is that we actually don't use the word system so much, but we almost never use the word environment. Um, and so, it, you know, if we're talking about threads in time, we're talking about things that are weaving together. It's like, well, what is the weave and what is the environment outside the weave? We don't really talk about that. And that's actually part of the of the Gregory Bateson influence that's come through from uh, from anthropology. Ah. Keacock Lee. So for the for the question, uh, here's a summary of uh, of Keacock Lee's work. 
a, a, a difference between the dualistic model that's in, in modern Western formal logic and the contextual dyadic approach. So the truth or falsity uh, in, in the West, there is a truth in, that's abstract or permanent and it's independent of context. And so this is very much like physics is that you build up and you know, so the apple always falls the same way no matter where you are and you extrapolate from the propositions. Um, in the Chinese sense, the application of meaning are relative to a particular context. And so we often, when we talk about yin and yang, we don't talk about the context because it's somewhat obvious, but maybe we need to actually make that less uh, implicit and actually explicit and should be talking actually about the context in which things work or don't work. Um, the pairings um, in the dual model, the oppositions are superior, inferior, subordinate. Subordinate. So in effect, you get one is good and one is bad. Uh, the pairings in the Chinese philosophy are a characteristic under context. And so we have, when you say cat, uh, you, and you in the, the opposite is a not cat, a non-cat. It's not the whole universe. Um, and uh, it talks about the context dependence. So a man or a woman can be superior, but it's like in what context the man or a woman is superior. The frames from, uh, from the dual model, hierarchical reductionist and uh, entity thing ontology, and within the Chinese logic, yin yang, harmonious whole, or mutual and gender are constraining. And again, this is a process thing. Uh, so the entity and entity thing ontology on the left uh, contrast with the engendering or constraining sort of process orientation that they have. Henri Lefebvre brings the idea of polyrhythmia, and we haven't used this extensively in the system changes learning circle yet in the workshops. We need to get better at this, is the idea of having rhythms and having all those things blend together. Um, isorhythmia is actually pretty rare, uh, having all everything beat together at the same time. Uh, we're looking for eurythmia, uh, where things kind of function together and, and they're present in a metastable environment. Um, arrhythmia is the one we're actually focused on, though. If we have eurythmia, then why would we bother with it? Uh, system changes is looking for those shifts that are a problem, and they're probably arrhythmic. Um, that brings us towards the end of the presentation. Um, system changes learning circle. You've seen many of these people on the uh, on the call today, um, and uh, you can approach any of us. We all have different approaches. Um, the system changes learning circle is one where we don't have a single approach. Uh, I'm the one that's the most academic, um, and maybe you want to deal with someone that's uh, more practical or has been working through this, and uh, you can talk to any of us about this. Um, we also are online, uh, so we use the Open Learning Commons, so at discussopenlearning.cc, you can sign up to that. Uh, if you're really interested, you could actually um, join the System Changes Learning Circle. Uh, we actually are, have a private chat space in uh, on the Digital Life Collective, and you join that for uh, eight, eight pounds or 10 USD to join, and it's a cooperative. Um, and you can keep track of all the things that we don't see in public. Um, with all the work that we've been doing in the System Changes Learning Circle, we want like keeping it informal, but we've partnered with the Creative Systemic Research Platform Institute. Um, and that's the conference that just came back from in Spain. Uh, this is incorporated as a not-for-profit in Switzerland. Um, and Susu Nosala and Yelena Zukic uh, worked through that. Uh, they were co-presidents on this. Um, and so when we actually need to do real work, we may actually um, do it with the CSRP Institute. And that's the talk. So uh, we can have more talk, uh, more discussion, and I'll stop the slides. Dan, are you going to field again? Want me to stop the recording? Um, no, we can keep recording. Okay. But, uh, but uh, yeah, we have more discussion if people have ideas. Or tired everyone out by now? No. Um, I'm still alert in here. <laughs> I think Aisha might have uh, raised her hand again, or I'm not sure. Did you want to continue or? OK. No, no, she didn't. OK. <clears throat> Uh, David, if I might ask a question, mm -hmm. 
uh, how important is hierarchy in the system you're dealing with? Hierarchy actually isn't something we discuss because um, the question would be if you're uh, a thread in the weave or not in the weave. Right. It was and, mentioned on one of your diagrams. Yeah, yeah. That's why I raised it. Yeah, so hierarchy is is more a Western concept. And, and that'll be an interesting blend because uh, uh, certainly panarchy is based off a hierarchy idea. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm not sure how we can reconcile that because we don't talk about subsystem and super system um, in this model. Um, so we're actually more concerned about trying to get um, uh, co the context, the contexture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I, I mentioned it again because of the Guangzhou Medical School. They had somehow emphasize Western medicine is much more hierarchical than they can manage. And they were not just casting dispersions, they were making fun of the hierarchy that we maintain in the West as part of medicine. And so they weren't quite sure what we were going to do about the hierarchy and that they saw that as a problem in the future. But, uh, but I think it's an interesting part of of your diagrams also on how to uh, reconcile it. And certainly in the work that I'm doing on climate change, uh, dispensation of hierarchy is quite important, it seems. And so Herbert Simon is sort of a great uh, villain or evil relative to work I've done for a long time. And that's why I like very much the work that you and I did on network theory as an alternative to hierarchy. It's, you know, I mean, fine. The Catholic Church can keep hierarchy, no problem. But, you know, that as long as they don't molest children with it, we're fine. But uh, uh, network theory seems to be much more alive and well and much more part of everything you do. And so, so that I'm not sure if the other listeners are quite aware of how much into network theory you are. Yeah, so so I think that um, uh, Tim Ingold actually we call it mesh work and trying to differentiate it from network because network may still have that idea that doesn't bring in time. Mm -hmm. um, and so we, we talk about lines and threads, but the lines and threads are in time. And that's where uh, when we're talking in time, I'm not sure what hierarchy means when we're talking about time. I, I recently, somewhat resolve the time issue. I have filed it, you won't like this, I'm sorry. I shouldn't bring it up now, but I've filed time away because I've decided that entropy defines time. Time does not define entropy. And that fits in with modern physics very well. And a number of leading physicists are very much on that edge that in essence, time is negotiable. Uh, entropy is not. Mm. And so uh, the time I'm sort of putting someplace else and, and not worrying as much about it, but hopefully I'm wrong because it really confuses things. It, it, it's a total mess if you go this way. So I, yeah. I recommend nobody else go this way. It leads to cycle problems. Yeah. I agree. I, I avoid the entropy discussion whenever I can. Yes. <laughs> okay, with that, I think Zad's going to help us out here, get us off entropy. Go ahead, Zad. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to switch my hand up to Ian's because I oh, okay. spend Sorry. a lot of time with David, so I'll come back to mine if there's time, but Ian, you can go okay. ahead. Uh, I was just interested to hear a little bit more about the, um, uh, in the in the slide you had about, uh, about putting Western and uh, Chinese philosophy together, Kikok Lee, the context, uh, the, the area on context, the importance of context as opposed to duality. Uh, yes. And so, um, so the, the Western idea is one of universality. Um, mm -hmm. and, and the issue is that when you talk about context, like, in effect, there is no universal. Um, and so, um, uh, if I take uh, uh, Elena's example before, it's like, you know, working, uh, cleaning house. Um, so is the context that you're doing it for yourself or the context that you're doing it for someone else? Um, 
and it, it makes a difference. Well, you're doing the same thing, you think, but then no, the context makes a difference. You're getting paid for it. So that, that's a good example that Elena brought up. Okay, and the and it's and it's sort of importance within systems systems work, systems change work is the understanding of the context of the system itself, not in terms of its, you know, the model represented by the system. Uh yeah, and so um so we, we were earlier talking about idealism and yeah. and so uh, ideal universality and idealism is kind of like you know the one best way and i and the response from a, a chinese perspective chinese philosophy perspective is there there is no one best way it depends so i guess if you're a consultant then you may say you're more chinese but you know you always have that question you know it depends on the context and and that's how you should approach it thanks do you My want audience. to go for, next to that, or do you want to, Elena had a question, but I'm not sure. Do you want to let her go in front of you, or do you want yeah, to? Yeah, I want to let Elena go, and then. Okay. Go. So, um, Elena, go ahead with the question that you I just you uh, just wondered about the re relationship between hierarchy, heterarchy, and panarchy. It, it seemed, I always think of panarchy as the adaptive cycle, which is essentially a process that goes, you know, through a kind of a, a regular pattern rather than one being superior or having any authority over the other. And I think of hierarchy as the example of of being the opposite of hierarchy, where it's a more self-referential, self-organizing system, where who, you know, whoever does what they're doing, um, either it's the person with the most information at the time or the person who doesn't need any other information to do what they need to do. So, so panarchy is actually not just the adaptive loop, but the uh, bigger, slower system that's above it and the faster, smaller system that is inside of it. Um, and so I've been looking at more closely, and, and this is part of what I'm thinking right now. I haven't written it yet. But uh, if we go and look at the panarchy, panarchy model, uh, it, they, they, they used to use the metaphor of a forest. Uh, and uh, what are the subgroups within the system changes learning circle is on uh, regenerative ecologies. And one of the things I've learned in that discussion is that the forest can reproduce and regenerate, but that doesn't mean every tree is going to make it, right? Because some trees will die and the forest will still be there. Um, when we look at this, and this is where I'm thinking about combining the, um, the uh, classical Chinese medicine with panarchy is again, uh, the uh, panarchy model is an ecological model in the sense that I've now described it uh, from the J.J. Gibson, uh, Tim Ingold perspective, whereas uh, the, um, the Chinese medicine is internal medicine. Uh, and so it, it, it's not we, we're throwing out system thinking. We actually, actually still have to define which system we're talking about. Um, but the panarchy model um, has that idea where uh, where they have the larger, slower systems as constraining. They have the remember, uh, remember link from the um, slower, faster system, from the slower, bigger systems into the system of interest. And then they've got the smaller, faster one with the revolt. Um, I'm thinking about that. I have to reread that some more and think about what I think about that. I'm not really sure. Most people do use the adaptive loop. But they don't really understand the adapt. The, they don't really understand the full panarchy model because they're not looking at the at the bigger and the smaller systems. I could I add a note? Um, uh, my good friend that died many years ago, uh, Gunnar Hedlund, and I uh, did a presentation at a systems conference where we were uh, asked to give this presentation to the whole conference. Um, because it was about Herbert Simon, and he was present at the conference, so they wanted us to give a presentation and bring up the issue he got the Nobel Prize for. And so we made this presentation on the distinction between uh, anarchy and hierarchy with uh, heterarchy in between. And so my friend Gunnar was passionate about heterarchy as he was taking it from the Greeks and he was quite loyal to it. I was quite passionate about anarchy and we made fun of heterarchy for 45 minutes with Herbert Simon sitting there. We used him quite frequently 
in our examples on why he had missed the boat, but all Nobel Prize winners in economics do miss the boat because it's not really a Nobel Prize anyway, and stuff like that. It was a humorous presentation, we thought. Uh, anyway, at the end, uh, the audience was very upset with us and more or less implied we should never come back to a systems conference meeting again if we're gonna think that way. And so the director of the meeting called for quiet. And then he said, he pointed to Russell Acoff and said, uh, Russell, what do you think of that presentation on anarchy, hierarchy, et cetera? And Russ responded, I agree with David and Gunnar. And then he forgot Russ and he turned over to Wes Churchman and said, Wes, one of the grand old men of our society, how do you feel about what you've just heard? And he said, I agree with Russ that agrees with David and Gunnar. So what are we gonna do? <laughs> and that was the end of the uh, presentation. Uh, since then, we, we wrote it up afterwards and I'm including it as a chapter in a book that I'm just now publishing. And uh, I think it's probably more relevant than it was way back then. Uh, the uh, heterarchy, et cetera, uh, is much more interesting than it used to be. Uh, hierarchy for me is mostly nonsense anymore. I, I, even the Catholic should move on and try something else for a while. But uh, it, 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 I think it's a very important topic. And if you talk about where companies are and how they can't get workers to come to the office and work and how they can't get people to work five days a week and, and all of that, uh, you can see the demise of uh, the concept of hierarchy, except perhaps in Russia, China, and a few places like that. But it's a good subject, David. Thanks for bringing it up again. This is time for Zad. I think, I think so, yeah. So <laughs> I'm gonna ask my question as if I'm not in the system changes circle. So this is a bizarro world, Zad, asking the question to himself in the group. Maybe a question or a comment, but it, it weaves together a couple of items. But David, in the opening sections of your presentations, you often talk about, when you talk about reifying systems uh, thinking and it's it's somewhat not ironic but meta that there's a context to why we, this may be relevant in the first like there's a context to why this way of thinking has even emerged itself and then on top of that when you show the demonstration of all the different schools of systems based off that stringer book um you start to see that the, we are or your team including myself is <laughs> weaving these ideas through time and i wondered how how much of the historical context, uh, you know, in, in terms of the discussion just a moment ago about the relationship of time plays a role in understanding these ideas and why they emerge. One thing I came across just as an interesting bit, it's not an academic piece, but just understanding why a lot of philosophers from, from the German school of thought, and there are those on the call here that would have way more knowledge than I do in this area, but as a reaction to the over-rationality of Newton scientific laws and Kant's rational, rational approach, many Germans were saying, let me get closer inwards to myself and to, to the earth and to the ground around me, rather than this overbearing rational God that was dictating a lot of elements of their life, uh, meaning uh, government, a God in that sense. And so there's a context to which ideas and philosophies emerge. And I wonder to what extent system changes learning kind of threads those historical contexts into their ideas. Yeah, we're, we're definitely, so the system changes learning circle is actually a science-based approach. With science, it's a process where we're learning in time. Um, so one of the pursuits I've had over the past 20 years, 30 years, has actually been to um, get to know the grad students of the system, some of the system's figures. Um, so uh, Christopher Alexander's grad students who are now like emeritus or retired, 
um, you know, churchman students. We met with Ian Mitroff and other other people. And so the sort of questions I would ask are, are uh, did West Churchman ever look into um, Eastern philosophies? And uh, the answer I got is, oh, yes, they were discussing it, but they never published anything. So I think that we are standing on the shoulders of giants. Like if they lived longer, then maybe, you know, it, there would be more continuity. But um, each of us contributes that way in the progression of science, um, bringing in um, these ideas of, of, uh, of Chinese philosophy. Like I really didn't go into Chinese philosophy because I wanted to. Um, I'm actually um, using uh, tr uh, classical Chinese medicine as an anchor because it's very concrete. Uh, and then the question will be, well, okay, there's these practices in classical Chinese medicine. Is there a science? And if there's a science, is there a philosophy of science behind that? And so I got backed into it. Uh, and uh, in understanding all of that, I've ended up in philosophy, but I'm not a natural philosopher per se. When when you describe science, is that where the part of the methods and the systematic approach comes in? Like, is that the science that you think about? Yeah, and and so uh, one of the things that uh, and and so the other subgroups within the system changes learning circle are actually not science. Uh, there is an art to systems thinking, and um, and just like there's an art to medicine, but we tend to focus on the on the science in medicine rather than the art in medicine. Um, so I, I think there's there's a lot to be learned. And so the system changes learning circle. I only see the rhythmic shifts and the science as one of the approaches and a good place to start. Uh, I think that that having a scientific approach is a good foundation, but it's not the whole thing. Thank you. Have to leave. Very interesting. Thank you. Uh, I think Aisha had this question about science. Did you want to? No, I didn't have a question. I oh. just I think it was just like a comment on oh, what you okay. were saying. So okay. thank you so much. Okay, it sounds like we're coming to a natural end, Dan. Um, would you like to yes. sign us off? You want me to stop the recording first? Okay, I've seen it. Where, where is it? Yeah. Yeah. So um uh for next